today's session. So today we're going to be talking about finding barriers to accessibility and our presenters for today are uh, Rob Carr, who is Accessibility Coordinator for Oklahoma Able Tech, which is Oklahoma's Assistive Technology Act program and it's housed at Oklahoma State University. And uh, also Steph Rogers, who is an instru instructional designer at the University of Central Oklahoma. So with that, uh, Rob and Steph, I will turn it over to you. Fantastic, Kyle. Thank you very much. And thank you, everybody, for joining us here this afternoon for a little bit. Um, I'm Rob. That's Steph. Steph's there somewhere. Yes. Hello. Hello, everyone. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, I'm excited to be part of the, the summit again and to have the opportunity to talk to you all a little bit uh, about how to identify barriers in digital stuff. And I'm actually going to uh, kind of lead us off here talking about the native web. And for those of you in the instructional context, uh, this the, the tools and the techniques that I'm going to show and that Steph is going to show a little bit later on, uh, the idea is to help you to be able to identify these things in your own content. And with the web piece, your view of that may vary quite a bit. So if you're authoring content in an LMS, then what you have control over is very different than if you are authoring content on, say, your own uh, faculty website, for example. The tools that I'm going to show you will work in either context on native web pages. Um, and what you have in front of you now is actually a really good instructional website that there are two versions of. This is called Accessible University. I'm just going to put the URL in the chat. It's a project um, that comes out of the University of Washington, and it has some features that are pretty common for public-facing higher ed websites, but there are a lot of features in the site that are pretty common for any content. And that's why I think it's a pretty good example. It's something that everybody can get to. I don't get accused of picking on anyone because I look at their content um, from their website or anything like that. And the nice thing about this is that there is an accessible version and an inaccessible version. We're going to start out with the inaccessible one and do some testing and point some things out. And I will then show you the accessible one to give you an idea of how different things look, not necessarily visibly on the screen, because actually it's really, really similar, um, but more so what changes in the testing when you go in and run some of the automated tests and when you do some of the manual checks as well. Um, as Kyle mentioned, feel free to type your questions into the chat just whenever. Don't need to hold uh, questions until any particular point in time here. Um, and otherwise, I'm just going to dive right in. With one exception, I'm going to put another URL into the chat window real quick because this will get you to the tool that I'm going to demonstrate here for the next few minutes. Uh, and that tool is the Wave uh, toolbar. Uh, it's a browser extension that's available on Firefox and Chrome both. And I'm in Chrome right now, so I'm going to show you the, the Chrome version. It looks exactly the same, whether you're in Chrome or Firefox. And if you go to wave.webaim.org, you can actually just paste a website address into that web page, and it will run the exact same checks on that page. The advantage of having these installed in your browser is that they will let you test in any page, even if there's a login. So if you are looking at content in your LMS while you're logged in, then the browser extensions will let you test that stuff as well. Um, so this may be a little bit of a crash course if accessibility is somewhat new, but I'm not going to get too far into the weeds with it at the same time. All of that said, let's show you what the tool does. When you install the tool into Chrome or Firefox, either one, you're going to have a little button that appears up with your other extensions just to the right of the address bar, and it's got kind of a wavy W on it. And if you just click that, you can also trigger it from the keyboard like all the other extensions. It runs a bunch of automated checks over the page that you're viewing at the time, and it puts these handy little icons out there. And depending on the structure of the page, it should put the icons really close to where there's a problem. Then on the left-hand side, it gives you a summary report, and it'll also let you drill down a little bit 
to find out more about the things that it identifies as errors, which on this page it gives us in the summary report a note that there are 21 errors. Then there are seven alerts, which are things that WAVE says, well, this could be an issue, but you really need to check it out manually. And then it gets into some more details that I'm probably not going to get much into uh, during the time that we have this afternoon. Uh, since this is an intentionally inaccessible site, seeing 21 errors is kind of an expected outcome. Over in the content, then, we get these handy little icons. And again, in this page, it does a really good job, Wave does a really good job of placing the icons next to the element where there is an error. Up at the very top, we have this note that says the following apply to the entire page. One of the reasons that I like Wave the most, especially if you're kind of new to accessibility, is that it lets you click on the error, even in the content, and it gives you a little flyout that tells you what the error is. So in this case, the document language for this page is missing. And the long story short of that is that every web page should have the language that the page should be read in specified in the HTML. So right off the bat, I know that, that that's not defined anywhere. That can be a problem if you have a page, for example, that's written in um, Spanish, but someone's using a screen reader that is set up to read in English because it is going to read the Spanish like like I would, and I don't know Spanish at all. So my ability to actually pronounce Spanish correctly is pretty much non-existent. So this language element is something that is pretty important to the experience of people who might use a screen reader. Then we have these other errors here in the page. We've got another little error here, and you can see when I ran the mouse over the little error icon in the content, it actually ran a, a box around the element that the error applies to. It's kind of a mouthful, but it lets you see visibly what the error actually applies to. I'm going to click on this one, and I see that I've got an image that doesn't have alternative text present. And alternative text is kind of one of the fundamentals of accessibility, similar to having the language of the page defined. And this is one, even if you're just testing your own content, uh, this is one that you might see if you haven't added this attribute or defined this attribute in your authoring environment. Almost every learning management platform out there lets you add alternative text either to an individual image when you include it in the content or into the image when you upload it into a library. Some systems have a multimedia library. Your mileage is going to vary, but what this does is it says, hey, this element isn't defined. Now, this is, again, more of a screen reader uh, centric kind of issue in the context of accessibility because the alternative text for an image is what a screen reader is going to read when it encounters an image. And alternative text needs to convey the intended meaning of an image. In this case, this is a logo for the fictional accessible university. And what you look for is the alt text to be reported out as accessible university. I'll show you in just a second a couple of examples of what happens when there is alternative text because WAVE doesn't make you dig around in the page to try to find that. It actually shows it to you on the screen if it's there. But here it's missing. And in this case, this is uh, actually a linked image in the page. Oh, no, it's not. Never mind. This is an image that has textual meaning. And so we need this alternative text to be defined. And what we look for is that the alt text is set to accessible university, that it would just reflect the text in the image. We've got similar little icons. That icon is a, a red icon with a slash through it. We've got similar icons for alternative text down in our slide show here. Um, you'll note that this isn't automatically scrolling. That's an accessibility issue as well, but not one that WAVE would necessarily report. Uh, but we, we can tell that visibly, that this is a slideshow that needs manual control. The problem here is that if I go over and look at this error, which again says missing alternative text, that is on an active element. That's on this right aiming arrow that tells us that this is the button that you'd use to move through the slideshow. So if I click on this with the mouse, I go to the next slide. Again, this is kind of a screen reader centric uh, test in this case, and the missing alternative text is going to be really important for folks who can't see the screen and are using a screen reader. But the alt text here needs to say something like, 
next slide. It needs to convey the function that the button has. So in this case, we know there's an issue because the screen reader is not going to read anything. We also see that same error on the image in the slide, and I, I think you kind of get the idea. We'll scroll down a little bit into the content of the page, and there are a few things that stand out. Visibly, we have four different section headings. So we have one that says, welcome, one that says, bienvenido, one that says, can you spot the barriers, and one that says, AU enrollment trends. Now, visibly, these are really clear section headings for each one of these sections on the page. What WAVE does is it will actually show you with a little H each one of the heading elements as defined in the HTML. So what's happened here is welcome and the other headings have all been turned into headings just by making them a larger font. And that's not enough. Uh, again, someone who can't see the screen and is using a screen reader isn't going to ever know that that is a heading for each one of these individual sections. With WAVE, this is actually something that we can catch as an error by visibly noting that there's no little H icon next to any of those at all. That's a relatively easy fix. Again, looking at it from the content side, it's pretty easy in almost every uh, content editor that I know of right now to apply a heading style to content like this. So if you run this on your own stuff and you see that you don't have those headings defined, it should be pretty easy to go in and to define them and, and take something away more so than just, gosh, I have this error on my page. When you get down to the table, this one is, is one that is relatively common and your mileage will vary quite a bit based on the authoring tool that you use. But this is a table that shows enrollment trends for a couple of years at this fictional accessible university. And it shows an icon. When I click on this wave icon, it says that there's a layout table present. Well, a layout table is something that kind of goes back a little ways with the web, but it's still something that will pop up in, in web design where someone is forced to, because maybe the platform won't let you or you don't have the permissions to do it another way, someone's forced to use a table uh, to keep content in a, a visible location on the screen. The problem here is that this is pretty clearly a data table. You know, we have these enrollment numbers and percentages and the different courses of study and dates. This is very clearly a data table. So in a situation like this, I shouldn't see this error that says that there's a layout table. So I know that I need to go into my authoring environment and see how I go about making sure that all of the table headers, whether they are headers for the rows up and down, like CS here is a header for uh, the column. I said the wrong thing for, uh, for this column that is underneath it. And ENG is a header for the data that falls under it. And then I've also got row headers over here at the side that tell me what the information in each row actually is. All of that stuff needs to be marked up in a certain way. And again, most of the authoring tools, most of the learning management platforms let you define table headers and let you uh, clarify and state specifically if those are headers for rows or columns. The fact that I've got this little layout table error tells me, well, nope, this, this is not set up the right way. I'm going to kind of skip over the form fields for the sake of time just to show another another piece of this testing tool, the WAVE toolbar, that I think is really helpful when it comes to visible design. There are a lot of implications uh, that color has with the accessibility of a website. And the WAVE tool has this little contrast button over in the summary report on the left-hand side. And when I click on that, what it shows me is the places on the page where it calculates a low contrast ratio between a text color and a background color. And this is something we can actually quantify. This is one of the tools, I think Steph is gonna talk about another one, but this is one of the tools that lets you actually see uh, as a, a number, as a ratio, the, the difference between the foreground and background. So I see in this about academics, admissions, and visitors in those navigation tabs, I see that I've got this error. And I can click on, if it'll let me click in the error, 
it tells me that I've got very low contrast. The problem is that it changes. So when I click on that, it runs the, the numbers and shows them to me on the left-hand side, but it shows them to me in this state where this actually isn't the case, which is another nice thing about this tool. If you ever find yourself in a situation where you can't click on an error and get a clear idea of what content it's reported on, you can click on the error over in the details pane on the left-hand side. So now if I click on this error, it highlights it in the content, and now it grabs the correct color. So it grabs this, this gray, and it grabs this cream, and it tells me the contrast ratio is 2.53 to 1. You might be sitting or standing there thinking, Rob, how do they uh, calculate that? And that's a really long answer that's way beyond the scope of this conversation, but it is a quantifiable thing. And the short answer is they grab the hexadecimal values, the, the value of each color, foreground and background, and run it through a big old long equation to come up with the ratio. With this or with any of the other contrast tools, you are looking for it to pass at a double A level. Most of the contrast tools will show you double A and triple A, and we're looking for this double A range. So in this case, it fails all of the above. And that's a really low ratio of contrast between the foreground and background. And you can think about this even just in the context of trying to read these tabs when you're outside, whether, really whether it's sunny or not, it's going to wash the text out almost completely. And for folks that have a variety of forms of low vision, poor color contrast will keep them from being able to perceive the text that's on screen. Contrast is probably one of the most common things that I report when I do assessments of websites, whether they're public facing or academic content, it's a really, really common thing. And that's why I wanted to be sure that I emphasize this feature in WAVE because I think it's incredibly helpful. And the other nice thing about it, and it hasn't worked for me for a little bit in this tool, but there are links under each one of the colors, the foreground and the background, that are just labeled lighter and darker. And I should be able to, there we go, I should be able to darken the color. And every time I click on, say, the darker link, it makes it a shade darker, but it keeps the color in the same family, keeps the color in the same line in the color wheel, basically. So it, this can actually help you to find a more accessible color contrast. What we're looking for is a ratio of four and a half to one. I clicked on that link once, it got me to 3.16 click on another couple of times, and I have to go pretty dark if I want to keep the same background color to get it to where it'll pass. You can see once I got past that threshold down here, it tells me at double A ratio it passes. It actually recalculates the contrast ratio each time you use that link. So this can be super helpful when you're trying to come up with a more accessible combination of colors. Let's say that there's a design decision somewhere that says, well, you can't go that dark. It needs to be a little bit lighter. Well, I can go to the background color and try to lighten it. And I'm going to lighten it by one, and I'm still not quite there. I lighten it twice, and I get to just white. So you can see that there's a little bit of a dance when it comes to color contrast. Uh, and I'm emphasizing it like I am because it is, number one, such a common error. Uh, and number two, so important for uh, us to make sure that the content that we create is actually perceivable by people, whether they're, again, outside or have some kind of a, a form of low vision. Now, really quickly, there are a lot of things that an automated tool can't catch. In fact, if the people who make the tools are honest, they'll say that most of the tools, whether they're free or paid, are really only going to catch 40, maybe 50% of the issues that can exist uh, that might keep somebody from being able to use your site. One of the things that you need to verify, and this is another visual design element, is something that is on display over here in the right-hand form. Uh, so we have this apply now, and it says required fields are in blue. Well, the way this is set up, that blue is super dark. So visibly, can anyone tell which ones are the required fields? And if you want to venture a guess, type it into the chat window. And if you can't, just say no. So there's a good mix. 
we got a couple of folks who saw it. Most of us can't tell, yet someone else can tell. So this kind of shows, and I'm not going to ask anybody about what their vision is like, but this demonstrates one of the other central visual elements of accessibility, and that is that, you know, Brett has name and email, but had to look close. Exactly. Um, anytime you use color to convey meaning, you need to use another visible element. Um, and that's why with things like form fields, what you'll see is what I'm going to move over to the accessible version of this page. And you see things like a part of the label that just says required, or you see an asterisk. Um, I see color used to convey meaning in charts and graphs a lot of the time. Um, and there are a lot of conversations about data visualization, which, you know, you read data visualization and you think this is a really sophisticated thing and it very much can be, but it can also be, you know, creating a good chart or graph in Excel. That's a data visualization. And the use of color is a really big part of that and making sure that we use color because it's tremendously effective with visuals, but that we also use something in addition to color. So with a line graph, you have red, blue, and green. You, you want to make sure you use a different pattern on the lines, uh, for example, to differentiate them in another way. Those are the kinds of checks that an automated tool isn't going to help with. Really quickly, I'm going to run wave over this more accessible version of the page. And the main thing I want to point out is that there's only one error here. Um, we can see that there is a lot of information reported up at the top that I'm not going to worry about. But when we get down into the content, you can see, for example, on the forward and backward arrows for the slideshow, it reports the alternative text that's there. It's, and so we can see that there is alt text present, and it says next slide for the, the right arrow that tells us visibly that it's going to advance to the next slide. For the left-facing arrow, it, the alt is reported as previous slide. So again, when there is alternative text for a visual, it's reported right here on the screen. You can see the display is dramatically different. The only other things that I want to contrast with the, the inaccessible version have to do with the, the headings. Like I mentioned now, by each one of these subheadings, we have an H. The two is the level of heading applied. So this, is, this fits logically. We've got a first level heading up at the very top of the page. And then each one of these is at the same level logically. And this tells us that each one is actually a heading. We've got this H2, so it's a second level heading. And then the last thing that I will mention is that the table is pretty dramatically different. Before, we just had that little icon from Wave that says this is a layout table. Now you can see that we've got column headers assigned. This tells you that it's uh, assigned as a column header. Over on the left-hand side, the little icon says row th tells you it's a row header so we have a dramatically different presentation here the tools and the websites are really really helpful um, again if you're kind of new to accessibility or if you haven't used an automated checking tool like this before this is a great way to compare and contrast the results and then the accessible university pages themselves are really well documented uh, to describe the differences and, to, and they go through and describe what makes one more accessible than the other. So I want to pause really briefly and just see what kinds of questions you all might have um, and, and uh, then we'll turn it over to Steph. Okay, Steph, take it away. All right, thanks, Rob. Let me get my screen shared here. Okay. Rob, can you tell me, am I, do I have the color contrast checker up or a Word document? A uh, Word document. Perfect. All right, so a lot of what Rob went over will also apply to the things I'm going to talk about. However, uh, the way you check them, the automated tools, and some of the stuff that the automated tools miss are a little bit different. So I'll be talking about some of the non-web elements such as Word documents, PowerPoints, and PDFs. So we'll try to get through all of that in the next 30 minutes. So looking at this Word document here, this is a syllabus template that I made and I took out the formatting. 
Uh, but when looking at it, it looks like there are some headings. You, it, visually, it, it makes sense. You're like, here's a heading one. Here's some other headings. This looks pretty great. Well, let's see what the accessibility checker tells us. So if you go up here to file, check for issues, check accessibility, and it's not giving us any warnings for headings, so that's great, right? Well, one thing I like to do with Word documents, every time I have one pulled up, I'll go over and pull up the navigation pane. To do that, you're gonna go to view, and then select this box, navigation pane. In this area, you see headings, and this is gonna actually show you if you have headings designated in your document. And as you can tell, there are no headings. So it looks like these headings were made using font styles such as bold and underline. And like Rob said earlier, that's not enough. So we're gonna have to go in and change these. To do that, you can come over to the line where you want to change your heading. So we want this one to be our heading one. If you come over where the arrow is pointing slightly up and to the right, and then you select the entire line, you can go up here to your styles and select heading one. And as you notice over here in the navigation pane, it went ahead and pulled that over. So we know that that's the heading one. And we're gonna go ahead and do that for all of these headings so that we make sure that they are uh, designated as headings for uh, people using assistive technology. So as you see, every time I go and select a heading, it pulls it up over there. So this one, I'm gonna do a heading three since it's under the instructor information. And so on and so forth. So now you have a logical heading structure and it will be available to those using screen readers. If we scroll down and let's talk about color contrast. Just looking at this, you can kind of tell that something's a little off, but say you're not sure, you wanna check and see if uh, it meets color contrast ratios. So if you go in here and I will say this is not a table or a text box or anything. What I've done is I've put a border around um, this element here, which is invisible to screen readers. So if, if you are wanting to uh, make a paragraph or sentence stand out, you can put a border around it instead of using a table to do that. So if I go up here, uh, if I wanna check the background color, go up to paragraph and the shading, select this drop down arrow, if you go to more colors, custom, and here you can get your uh, RGB numbers. Uh, and I will say that color contrast is not something that is checked by uh, Microsoft Office accessibility checkers. So if you do see something like this and you're not sure if it meets the contrast ratio, then you'll have to do a manual check. So I'm gonna go, I went ahead and pulled these uh, colors and I'm gonna show you in a um, uh, here we go. There are two color contrast checkers that I like to use. There's WebAIM and uh, Level Access, and I'll go ahead and put these um, in the chat window. So the great thing about the WebAIM color contrast checker is you come down here and you see that it's failed all of the uh, AA standards. Um, to go in and, so if you don't have the hex value and you wanna put in the RGB values, you can actually select the color right here and put it, put it in here. But we wanna keep it zero, because that's what we had it. Um, so as Rob showed you earlier in WAVE, uh, if you're wanting to change the color so that it is accessible and meets contrast ratio, uh, for his, there were light and dark uh, links that you could select. On this one, you can actually uh, drag this um, value here and you see that the contrast ratio is changing and then it's also changing the colors uh, in the boxes below to show you a preview. You can also go over to this one if you wanna change the background color. And once you reach a passing level, it will change, uh, it'll say pass down here and it'll turn it into a green bubble. So we want it to meet normal text, double uh, A. So let's keep going with that. And there we go, now it passes. So to get the values for that, you can select on here 
on the, the color box. And you go up here and you can pull these numbers. So let's go back to our Word document. Let's see, it was 204, Oops. 204. All right, now that is technically considered um, compliant. It meets the contrast ratios. Now, if we keep scrolling down and look at this table, the table looks fine, but we're getting an error over here and it's saying that there's no header row specified. So to do that, we are going to put your cursor in the header row here, go to your table tools, layout, and you're gonna select repeat header rows. This actually has another function as well as tagging it as um, a header row for assistive technology. Um, if you are creating a table and say it's two pages long, if you come down here and here, here's your table on the second page, the headers actually will repeat onto the second page. If you do not have header rows selected, they won't repeat. So for anybody, that could be really confusing, especially if you have a, like a course schedule or something like that and it's two pages long and you know you get all the way down here and you're wondering, oh, what was this column for? Well, if you have uh, your header rows selected up here, it'll repeat every page that the table is on. Let's see, and then the, the blank table rows or columns, this warning will go away once you fill in your table. So no need to worry about that. All right, so now uh, it's telling us that there's unclear hyperlink text. So if we actually click on this, it'll take us to where uh, the link is. So this isn't really going to tell someone using a screen reader the destination of this link. It'll actually read this as www uco.edu. So that's not really going to make sense. To change this, you can right click, you can edit hyperlink, and then up here where it says text to display, you can put your link text. So let's say UCO homepage. Hit OK. And what I also like to do is I like to actually include the URL in case this was a document that um, was going to be printed. Um, so, oops. let's see, so I will do, do that, but I will take the hyperlink out so it's not read uh, by screen reader as a link but it's still available to somebody if they printed this document out and they needed that URL. And lastly for this Word document, we don't have a warning over here for alt text. Something I always do, if there are images, even if I don't have a warning, I will go in and check them. So to do that, you're gonna select the image, you're gonna right click, go to format picture, Go to Layout and Properties. And down here in the description is where our alt text is. Well, it says, it, it looks like it's a URL. Well, that's not very descriptive for this image. That's one thing that um, I've noticed in PowerPoint, uh, Word, PDF, the accessibility checker does not trigger a warning if there's a URL in the description. So that's why I always go in and check because we don't want the URL in the description. That doesn't tell us anything about the picture. We wanna actually describe uh, the purpose of the picture. So that's just something to keep in mind as you're going through your documents, um, especially if you pull something from the web, sometimes it'll put in a file path or a URL and it won't trigger the, um, the warning from the accessibility checker. So it's always good to check that. All right, let's move into, does anybody have any questions about uh, Word documents? Okay. So going into PowerPoints, 
Uh, the same thing with color contrast, checking that, that's kind of the same as in Word. Same with hyperlinks and alt text for images. But some things that um, I want to talk about with PowerPoints are uh, reading order and slide titles. So it's really important for navigation purposes for uh, people using assistive technology as well as people not using assistive technology is to have unique slide titles for every single slide. So if we look on here, on these two slides, they both have the same slide title. If there's only two slides with the same slide title, you can actually on the second one just put continued afterwards because it's a continuation of the previous slide. Um, and then if you notice over here on our accessibility checker, these are all the slides that have duplicate slide titles. So it will at least check that for you. However, there is a way to trick the accessibility checker and not in a good way. Um, and that's to go in and just put a space after, um, after the second slide title. Uh, it will make the warning go away, but this actually doesn't help anyone. We want them to be able to differentiate between the, the two slides that have the same title. So since this is the second one, we want to say that this is continued. So I would just go in oops, and put continued. And you can format that if you want. If you don't want it to be the same size as the actual title, you could go in and make it a little smaller. Um, but it is important uh, to put continued and not just put a space because the space will make the warning go away, but that again is not helping anybody. Um, the next thing we want to look at is reading order. Um, and to do that, you go up here to arrange, go to the selection pane. And over here we have our reading order. You can click on each of these elements and it'll put a box around everything um, in the slide. So it is, so the way it's read it, right now is, um, well, it's not correct, but it reads from bottom up. So you want your title to be the first thing that should be at the bottom. And then you just look at it and then put the reading order in a logical way that it should be read. So the next thing should be this contact content holder, but it's last. So we're going to go up here and you can just drag it down. You can also use these arrows up here to, to move the element as well. So we've done that. And those could be in whichever order you decide. So the same with every single slide, you have to check the reading order. Because it looks like all of these content placeholders are last, but we don't want them to be last. We want them to be right after the title. And I'll just show you the same PowerPoint um, that does have some of the accessibility stuff built into it. So if you'll notice, there's continued after a lot of these. Um, if there are more than one, or I'm sorry, more than two slides of the same title, you can put part one or um, section one or just a one or something, something that differentiates it from the other one. So right here, I have three of the same uh, titles. So I have part one, part two, and part three. And that about does it for PowerPoints. So let's uh, jump over to a PDF. So with PDFs, um, I want to talk about uh, the native accessibility checker as well as a plugin called Common Look PDF Validator. And the accessibility checker, it, it does a pretty good job actually. Um, however, the, the Common Look PDF Validator, it goes in depth and it checks everything. And you can actually uh, have it check against WCAG, um, Section 508, which the WCAG 2.0 checker is a lot more in depth than the 508 one. Um, so it's really good. And you can actually print out a report from it um, if you need that at your institution. So what I'm going to do here is I'm going to go to my accessibility tool over here. If you don't have your accessibility tool over here, there are a couple ways uh, you can get that. Um, you can go to more tools here where all of your tools are. 
Um, you can also go up to view and look at your tools from here. So if I go into accessibility, I'm going to do a full check and all of that is correct. Start checking and it's going to pull up um, any issues that I have. So looking at this, I have three figures that do not have alternate text. Once you click on these, it'll take you to those figures. Um, tab order has failed. Uh, there's a, this is an easy fix. You can actually right click, hit fix, and it will automatically do that for you. And then this uh, under document, primary language and title almost always fail. Uh, one thing I will note, if you are creating um, a document in say Word or PowerPoint that you intend to export to PDF, it is really important that you create those documents with accessibility in mind because it will transfer over to PDF a lot better if you've already put in those elements such as headings, table headers, uh, alt text for images, things like that. So let's go ahead and open up the PDF uh, validator. Um, so this is something you just download and then it will be uh, added in up here as a plugin. See if it will go. There we go. Okay, so it opens up in a new window here. If you go all the way to the right here, if you look at standards, click that, click accessibility, and here you can see the different accessibility standards that you can check against. Uh, and if you click these arrows, it will show you everything here that it will check against. So let's just um, let's start with section 508. We're going to click that, do a full check. And down here is your report. You can filter it by um, pass, failed, um, user verification, um, all of these. So let's just see what has failed. Okay, so if you click on this, it'll show you, okay, so we knew that, that um, uh, alt text was missing from these images, but that's all it's telling us it's failed. So let's look and see what WCAG 2.0 tells us. All right, so it gets us a little inf more information. So again, it has the uh, images. It's also telling us that the document does not define any headings. So we actually didn't get that uh, with the native accessibility checker um, in PDF. So now we know we need to go check for headings. Um, down here, it's telling us that uh, the, the the document language isn't present. And so we knew that, but it's going to tell us for every single element that's tagged. So that kind of looks like a lot. So now, so this is the free version. Um, as far as I can tell, you can't actually make any changes in here with the free version. Uh, so if you want to pay for it, I think you would be able to remediate it in the common look PDF validator. However, if you don't want to pay for it and you just have the free version, you can just kind of look and see what you have. Uh, then close out of this, go, or you could actually uh, save the report. Um, I've already saved it here, so let's see. Let's just save that real quick. And then you can pull that up, close out of this, and let's, let's do that and see. All right, so this is what the report's going to look like um, uh, that you get from the PDF validator. So it's going to tell you the element path uh, in the tag trees, which page number they're on, um, the, the uh, title and author, um, that's metadata. So we can either do that from the accessibility checker or we can go to the file and properties, um, the headings, 
it's not giving us page numbers because there are no headings. It's telling us that we need to create headings. So we'll have to go in and do that. So if we go back to our PDF, um, we go to accessibility, let's do our full check again. All right, so to adult text, we would come over here, right click on these figures, fix, and then you could type your alt text in here. If it's decorative, you can select decorative and move on. To fix the language issue, all you do here is you right click on primary language, fix. It's gonna ask you to set the reading language. Um, for the most part, I think everyone here should be setting it in English and that is the default. So um, it'll automatically pull that up. You just hit okay. And then title. There are a couple ways you can fix this. Um, you can right click here, fix. Um, that probably actually didn't fix it. So we're gonna need to go up and double check. Um, so don't just assume that that fixes it. Uh, go to file, properties, and Here's the title, Kirkpatrick's Four Levels of Evaluation, which actually it looks like it did um, do that correctly. Um, the author, you can also put in keywords, a subject, just any additional information um, that could be useful uh, to those using assistive technology. Okay, I think that about does it. I went through that really fast. Uh, does anyone have any questions? We can wait just a moment to see if anybody wants to type a question into the chat box. And um, Steph, would you mind putting those links into the chat as well? And we'll also post them uh, on Facebook in case anybody is watching this later on and, and wants to check out those resources. Yes, I will sure do that. And I also have some links for, um, I was gonna mention another testing tool that you can use. You can use uh, screen readers as a testing tool. You don't have to be perfect at them. I'm still learning stuff every single day about how to use them. Um, but I'll post some links on here. NVDA is a free screen reader that you can download to your desktop and use. Um, and I'm also gonna post, uh, the WebAIM has some shortcut, keyboard shortcuts for NVDA that you can use. I've printed them out and put them on my desktop so that I can see them as I'm, as I'm testing with them. Um, so it's been really helpful. So I'll go ahead and put that in the chat. Perfect. Thank you. Hey, and I was just going to jump in. This is Rob and I wanted to show another contrast tool. I saw a comment, um, about another way to kind of check visibly in word. Um, I use a tool called the color contrast analyzer and let me put that into the chat as well. But this is a super helpful tool because it uses eyedroppers to grab the colors. So I'm still on that accessible university site, but you can use this on Word docs, PDF, PowerPoint, anything you can see on your screen, you can use this tool. <clears throat> so I'm going to come in, let's see, I'm on the after, I'm going to go back to the uh, original inaccessible version of this site that we looked at where we had the contrast errors. And I'm gonna grab, it. we've got two uh, eyedropper buttons, one for the foreground, one for the background. I'm gonna see if it'll let me grab foreground color. You can see it zooms in quite a bit so that you can literally pick pixel by pixel. I'm using the mouse to get it close and I'm gonna use the arrow key to actually center in on the darkest part of the font here. I can click or I can use the inner key to select the foreground. I'm going to grab the background color, which is a lot easier. It's a lot bigger target. And it runs the hexadecimal values through that same algorithm to give you pass or fail. Uh, I think this is incredibly, incredibly helpful, both on the web and especially for non-web stuff, for those PDF and Word and PowerPoint files that you're working with, uh, because it just makes it much quicker to grab the hexadecimal values. And then, um, like Steph showed how to use the WebAIM site, the WebAIM color contrast tool to do the lighten and darken trick. So you can use this to grab those hex values just as a, a, a quick little referral out to that one. And yeah, I did put it in the, uh, the chat there. 
Perfect. So a couple of things from our chat. Uh, Ali points out that one more way to check color contrast in Office is to move into high contrast mode by doing left shift, left alt print screen and seeing how it looks. With Mac, uh, not aware of any quick ways beyond system preferences and accessibility. And then uh, Brandy Hinesley Chambers wants to know if there are any checklists or tip lists that you could use to uh, disperse to others at their institutions. Um, yeah, I, I mean, we definitely have some checklists that we use here um, that we've created in-house. Uh, I'd, I'd be happy to share those out. Um, just uh, things that we give our faculty just here, are the most common things, you know, that we see, uh, some errors that we see and for for them to check that as they're creating their content. So yeah, we could definitely share that out. Okay. And then Scott asks, do PDFs ever lose accessibility when being converted from other file types? Um, so are you saying if something is, let's see, converted from like Word or PowerPoint or, or something like that? Uh, so like I was saying earlier, if generally, if you do the things correctly in your authoring tool, like using the heading styles and making sure I'm putting in alt text, things like that, most stuff generally transfers. However, that it's not always 100% and that's why the accessibility checker is there. Um, and just kind of the more you do it, I, I would say you just kind of get comfortable and, and you have certain things that you look for that you know aren't transferring over whenever you're um, exporting from something else. But for the most part, if it's created correctly with accessibility in mind in the authoring tool, it should uh, transfer over pretty nicely. There are a couple things I'll add to that. Um, because it does depend how, say you're working in Microsoft Office, uh, it depends on how you actually create the PDF. So especially if you're in the latest and greatest or, you know, Office 2016 on Windows, and I think latest and greatest Mac versions, you have to do a save as PDF, not a print to PDF. If you do print to PDF, all the work you do in Office to make the document accessible is going to go away, except for the visible stuff. So that's one thing. Make sure you do save as PDF, and then all that stuff will go along. All that stuff being things like headings and alt text and everything that Steph talked about. The other piece is that how that all works and how well it works improves with the later versions of Office. If you're on Office 2010, then there's going to be some kind of wonky stuff that you need to go back and, and look for in the PDF and fix with Acrobat Pro. If you're in the later versions, again, 2016 or, or 365, um, things don't tend to kind of go a little bit haywire. Uh, and the biggest problem was with reading order of content. It would put in 2010, if you're in Office 2010, all of the images would appear at the top of the reading order in the PDF, even when you did save as PDF. Um, and that's, they, they fixed that, I think, with about Office 2013 on the PC side. So a couple of considerations just to be sure that you are um, making sure you're getting everything in there and you're not kind of working against yourself. Yeah, and Brandy mentions that's a really good point. If you choose, if you let Acrobat do stuff automatically, um, if you let it add tags automatically, then there's a really good chance that it's not just going to fill in the tags that are missing. It can go in and redo a bunch of stuff as well. Um, so that's that's very true. Anytime you you turn Acrobat loose, it tends to sometimes get creative. Steph, was that your is that your take as well? Oh yeah, definitely. Um... Yeah, because it will actually, if you've already, if there are already tags in it and then you do an auto tag, um, it'll just re-tag everything and anything that you put in there will be lost for the most part. How, I will say though, using the auto tag function is good if you get a PDF that has no tags whatsoever and it's, say you have a really long PDF, at least get that auto tag in there and it'll, uh, and then you can clean it up as you go along instead of having to tag everything individually and and like you said Rob the latest versions are always the best um, and the latest version of Adobe Acrobat um, so far that I've seen has done pretty well with auto tagging for documents that are untagged as well as enhancing scanned um, scanned PDFs or scanned articles or or whatnot does a pretty good job okay great uh, 
I think if anybody has uh, one more question, we have time for about one more. And um, on checklists and anything else that you guys think it might be helpful to have, uh, maybe we could um, add those to our uh, post about today's uh, presentation on the uh, LIS Summit website. So um, everybody make sure and, and, and check that out. and. Uh, if you guys have anything that you think would be helpful to share, feel free to send that to me and we can get that posted on the site as well. Uh, so for our last question, uh, Brandy asked any tips on scan, uh, scan documents on PDFs? Um, I mean, there is a tool in PDF or in Adobe, excuse me, uh, where you can try to enhance the scan and try to recognize the text. It doesn't always work, um, and sometimes when it does try to enhance the scan, it actually uh, makes the visibility worse. <laughs> um, so it's kind of I've kind of gone back. It, it depends on the quality of the original scan document. If it's a pretty good scan, then for the most part, um, it should be able to recognize the text and pick it out. If it's an older document or if it's already blurry or the, the very pixelated, sometimes it won't, it just won't do it. Um, I don't know, Rob, do you have any other suggestions for some of the yuckier looking scanned, uh, scanned PDFs? I mean, sometimes the, so the technology is called OCR or optical character recognition, and that's what you look for in Acrobat Pro to, to run automatically. There are more sophisticated OCR tools out there. Um, and I can't name too many off the top of my head, but uh, if you have a really high volume um, and, you know, they seem to be kind of borderline or you're not, they're not coming out uh, using Adobe Acrobat Pro's OCR, um, you might consider demoing a more sophisticated OCR tool that might do better and make the process at least more efficient. Uh, whatever you end up with, there's still going to be a lot of work to go in and do the identification of headings and add alt text images and all that kind of good stuff. But you might look around for some OCR tools that, again, might at least take away some of the work and keep you from having to completely start over and, and retype or recreate them. Um, but this is a really common thing in higher ed, especially because you end up doing a lot of alt format stuff. Um, and the more sophisticated the OCR, uh, of course, the more outlay it is financially, but it really might make sense if y'all are hand typing everything. All right. Thank you so much, Rob and Steph, for the session. This is the first one where we've really just bumped up against the hour. So um, I think that just goes to show that this is something that people are, are really interested in and such an important topic. So um, I hope that uh, everybody will be able to join us for the rest of the uh, presentations this week. Uh, we have a, a few uh, left and, um, and uh, like I said, stellar quality really uh, for our summit presenters this year. Uh, so uh, Rob has, has typed his uh, contact information there in the chat, RG Carr at okstate.edu, and Steph is srogers18 at uco.edu. So once again, thanks to both of you for an outstanding presentation, and I hope to see everybody uh, again this week. Thanks, everyone. Yep, thanks for having us.